Hello everyone, this is Johannes and you are watching Board Gaming Ramblings and today we are taking a look at a new game from Eric Lang and Simon Games and that game is of course Rising Sun which just arrived last week from Kickstarter. I did back this game on Kickstarter so I do have a lot of the exclusives in this game and I will use some of the plastic bits that are upgraded from tokens in the rules explanation but other than that I'm not going to use anything in the rules or talk about anything uh, of course without a comparison about the retail and the Kickstarter version which I obviously have to do in this game because there's so much stuff going on but I will not talk about all these game-changing things when I talk about how I feel about the game as much as I can of course because I have played with the Kickstarter exclusives as well. But enough rambling, let's get down to the table, see how this game plays and let's come back up and see what I think about the sun rising in Rising Sun. Okay let's talk about how to play Rising Sun. I am not going to go into full detail of everything in the game as there are a lot of different player powers, a lot of different cards you can get with different uh, actions and powers. I'm not going to go into detail of that. I'm just going to go talking about how one round of the game works. And so you get a little bit of feeling about how this game feels and a little bit of feeling about the game plays. So, in this game you are going to play three rounds of gameplay. You are going to play through this uh, track here three times to see who gets the most points. At the beginning of each round you are going to have a tea ceremony and this is where the players decide if they want to ally up. You're going to have one each of these tiles that when you choose to ally, I only have two here for example, but when you choose to ally you will put them together like this, like a yin yang symbol and now you are allies maybe for the rest of the round. So let's say that's how that works and as it is in this game you can negotiate, you can bribe, you can try to pay people to do the stuff you want, pay people to be ally with you. If maybe it's more beneficial for you to be an ally, you can pay them off to, to, to make them be your ally anyways. So that is how you're going to do that and then you're going to go out to this political mandate phase. And there are 10 of these tiles in the game. They are going to be 5 different actions, so we're going to go through them in order here from what is on the player board. We have Recruit, we have Marshal is somewhere here, we got Train, Betray and Marshal. So these are the 5 different actions you can choose. And the way this works is that you're going to, the player who is first in line is going to pick up the 4, 4, 4, 4, four. Take a fur, not fur, four tiles from the top of the deck, look at them and choose one to play here and that is the actions you're going to do. So let's go through them, we're going to start with Recruit. Most of these actions are really really simple. Recruit works like this, you are now able to put your dudes onto this map. Uh, and the way this works is that it starts with the player to the left of the player who chose it so that you are in the last person to do it, which is usually best because you can see what the other players have already done. So the way this works is that you can now summon one figure for each of these strongholds you have in the game. So let's say I am the pink player, I have three of these strongholds, I can now summon three figures. If I was the person who played this or if I was an ally to the person who played this, I could play one additional figure to one of my strongholds. Each player has in the beginning of the game three different kind of figures. You have the Daimo, which is the leader of the clan who has the black base. You have the Bushi, two different uh, Bushi figures, which are the kind of foot soldiers, the, the normal guys. And then you have the Shintos, the white based figures. Uh, first thing is that every figure is one force. That means they have one power in, in combat and when you have to, to, to compare force. Uh, the only difference between them is that this hat is immune to special abilities, immune to, to actually abilities. The bushes are not immune to anything, they can be done whatever they want to be done with. And the Shintos, the special thing about the Shinto is that when you summon a Shinto, you can send it up to one of these shrines to worship one of the four gods that are going to be in the game. So let's say I want to I summon him, but I want to set him up here with this god right here. And that is how Recruit works, you go around with everybody do it. And then you have Marshall. The way Marshall works is that you get to move your figures. And again it starts with the player to the left of the player who chose it. Everybody gets to move 
all the figures in one space. You can move as many or as few figures as you want. One space each, and that's it. If you are a player who played it, or if you are an ally with a player who played it, you can pay three coins, three plasticky coins, to put out one more of your fortresses. And the next action is a train. And this is where you get cards to maximize your strategy and to help out with the kind of thing you want to do. At the beginning of each season, you're going to put out a lot of these cards. I'm not going to go into detail about them because there's a lot of different kind of cards. There are some enhancements. This is the way you get monsters. If you buy a monster card, you will get this monster, apply a base and summon it at once. Other than that, there are different upgrades which gives you special abilities during the game. And then every card has a price, it might be free, it might cost 1, 2, 3, and so on. If you are the player who played Train, or if you are the player who was an ally with the player who played Train, you pay one coin less. The only difference with Train also is that the player who played it is the player who starts, because of course that's best. So in these two cases it would be best to go last, and in this case it would be best to go first. And then we are going to go to this phase soon, I'm just going to go through the last two actions first. We have the Harvest phase. The first thing that happens in the harvest phase is that every player is going to get one coin. And when everybody's gotten one coin, then if you are the player who played this, or if you are the ally to the player who played this, you are going to be able to harvest from these regions on the map. In on each region, you see there are a little bit, uh, there are some symbols here. The rising sun is, of course, points. You have the Ronin, which are these Ronin tokens you can get, and you have money. And the way this works is that you go through all the provinces and see each and every province that I have the most force in. And every province I have the most force in, and also my ally have the most force in, we will get the harvest from that tile. Of course, I will only get the ones that I have the most force in, and he will get the ones he has the most force in. If there are ever in this game, this is a good point to, to, uh, to, to point that out, if there are ever in this game a tie of any sort, then we see this honor track up here, it's where it's at. This honor track always breaks ties. So if you want to be like high honor, you will always break ties. If you are low in honor, you will have to have more force or more power there to actually get things done. And this is one of the main ways to get uh, coins during the round. You can get some Ronin tokens for you, which you can use in combat, which we're going to explain later. And you can get some straight up points just to get points and be nearer to be the winner. The last action is the betray action. This is the part where you will betray your allies or betray people so that you will come up on top. This is action is working this way. This is the only action which only you get a benefit from. First off, if you are in an alliance, that alliance breaks. Boom! It goes apart and you will lose one honor. So let's say I was the blue player, I will go one down on the track and somebody else will go up on the track. And then I can replace two figures on the board. Let's say I want to replace this one. I can put on one of my figures. And I can replace two figures on the board, but they have to be from two different players. Also, they have to be uh, the same uh, exchange. So I can replace a Bushi for a Bushi, a Shinto for a Shinto, a Monster for a Monster. The Daimo are, as I said, immune uh, against these uh, special abilities, so you can't use Betray on him. And that are all the five actions you can choose in the game. Between the third action, after the third action, the fifth action, and the seventh actions, is going to be a Kami round. And the way this works is that there are also some arena majority up on these four shrines. And I'm not going to go into details about what they do because they're going to be different in each game. But basically, again, you're going to compare force. The one with the most force is going to win that shrine. If there is a tie, of course, honor breaks it. So there are different things you can do, you can get points for strongholds, you can get extra rounding tokens, extra coin, or extra movement, which is going to be really strong, especially before the war phase. And then we're going to go to the war phase, so you're going to play three of these, a coming round, two of these, a coming round, and two of these, and then a coming round. And then we go into the war phase. At the beginning of each round you're going to put out these five war tokens. And these four, five war tokens is going to tell you where there's going to be a war this round. And you're also going to put out these markers to see where the wars are going to be. So, the way this works is there's three different kind of outcomes there can be in the beginning of a war. Let's say up here. There's only one figure. He's the only one there. He will basically just win the war. So he gets this, which will be points at the end of the game. The second warrior is, let's say, these two. 
two, two people out there, but there are in an alliance. And then there's not going to be a war, you're just going to compare force. If there's a tie, you're going to go to the honor, and that player gets that thing. Then, let's say a number three is over here. Let's just say it's here. You're going to do an actual combat. If these, let's say I betrayed. Boom, I betrayed. Now we're going to actually do combat up in this space here. And the way this works is that you're going to take, every player has a player aid with all the actions. On the back of that is a war advantages uh, board. You're going to take that, you are going to take your player screen and put it in front of it. I'm not going to do that now, of course, because it's going to be a really stupid way of explaining it. And here you are going to do a blind bidding. So everybody's going to say like how many coins you have and how many ronins you have. Let's say I have two ronins and I have six coins. I'm going to say I have six coins and two ronins, then I'm going to take everything behind the screen and we're going to bid. So before I go into what these different things do, I'm just going to show you the way the bidding works. You're just going to bid on the things you want to do and then you're going to reveal and the player who has the most of in each space is going to be able to do that thing. You start from here and move your way over. Of course, if there's a tie, it's broken by honor. So let's go through these different kind of special war actions you can do. The first one is that you can perform a seppuku. And the way this works is that you may kill, as it says, you may kill all your figures. If you do that, let's say I was the blue player, I performed seppuku, these would be dead. I will then get two points, one point for each and one honor for each. So this is a way if you are low in honor, you can go high up in honor again. Next thing that works is that you can take hostage. And the way that works is basically you can take a figure from the other player out of the game, not out of the game, but just to the side, and then you will take one point from him and he will lose a point. So if he's at zero points, you're not going to get any points. The next thing is higher Ronin. If I have the most on higher Ronin, I may add all my one force for each Ronin token I have to the battle. So if I have, I'm here, I am the purple player or the pink player, I have one force. With these two, I have three force and I'm now in the lead to win. You don't lose this until the end of the war phase, so you can use this over and over in battle. If you have accumulated a lot of them, they can be a really huge advantage. After that, you're going to do the battle outcome. So let's say here, I go to add my Ronins, that's 3 Force versus 2 Force. I will win that space and I will get the war token for it. And then the last thing is the Imperial Poets. If you are the biggest winner or the biggest bidder there, you will get one point for every player or every character, every figure that was killed during that round. Also in Seppuku, see if you want to do Seppuku with a lot of characters, this can also be good to do in Imperial Poets to get double the points. And that you're going to do with all, all of the War Provinces, there's always two more than the number of players. You're going to go through that, then you're going to reset, shuffle all the tiles, continue with the next player in turn order, and go through this two more times before the game ends. At the end of the game, you're going to score points for some winter upgrades cards you can get in the autumn. You will get score points for these, three points for the last round, two for the second and one for the first round. Also there's kind of a set collection, if you get enough different of these, you will score some high bonus points. And at the end, the player who has the most points is the winner of Rising Sun. And that is how you play Rising Sun. The, I probably didn't go over everything in the rules, like every little detail, but I think I hopefully you got a feeling about how the game plays, if you didn't already know how to play the game. The game feels pretty simple, like not simple, like this is really easy, but the rules, I really like games like this, which have pretty simple rules. This game has five different actions to choose from. Of course, a lot of the depth in the games come from the choices your opponents make, from the interaction between the players, and from what you do like with the blind bidding in the war phase and stuff like that. But the, but the basic rules about, I do a train action, everybody gets to buy a car. I do a recruit action, everybody gets to put dudes on the map. I do a martial action, everybody gets to move. It, it's pretty simple that way, like the, the, the actions in themselves are really simple and easy to, to understand. I, I really enjoyed, one of the things I really enjoyed about Blood Rage, we played a Blood Rage like two weeks ago. I hadn't played it in one and a half years, but I, I still remembered almost every single rule of that game. I don't usually do that in games. I usually have to sit and actually just at least skim the rules. In Blood Rage, I had to check a couple of the rules to, to, to see how it worked. And I think it would be like this as well. When we stop playing this now, when we take it up again in like one and a half years or something like that, in a year or hopefully sooner than that, then I probably will remember all the rules of the game. But 
Let's start at the beginning with uh, this review, beginning of this final thoughts, conclusion, I don't know, everything about the game I want to talk about. Let's start with the simple thing is the components. The components are beautiful. Just like, look at these minis, if you have not seen them yet. You want to go to my unboxing video, we have a close-up shots on almost every miniature in the, in the game. So you can check that out and see how these, these minis look so beautiful. I know also there was one guy who did a 360 video of every single monster or every single miniature, I think. So you can go and check that out as well. The details are amazing. Everything looks so beautiful. I... I'm not going to talk about, as I said, I'm not going to talk about the Kickstarter exclusives, like you have the, the plastic fortresses instead of the tokens. We are going to talk more about that when I get to the Kickstarter versus retail part of this conclusion, final thoughts thing of this review. So, let's go to gameplay. This is the biggest chunk, of course, because gameplay is everything. I, I like good minis. I enjoy the, that the game looks beautiful, but, but for me, gameplay comes over everything else. Like, I... I need good gameplay, I don't really, if this miniature was really cool and the game was really boring, I would not care about the game at all, I could have the miniatures on my shelf, look at them and say that's a cool miniature, but I would not have the, I would not really need to play the game ever again. So is this game any good? Yes it is. I am gonna talk about a little bit more than that, that's not the end of the review, like, is the game good? Yes, that's the end of the review, it's not. So let's talk about uh, the gameplay. First of all, this is a game that's pretty darn different than the games I usually play. I like playing Euro game where I sit in my own corner and I do some puzzles and I try to get some points and be happy. That is basically what I want to do in this game. I, I'm going to walk around on a map, I'm going to kill people and combat people and betray them and do stuff like that, which is usually stuff I don't like at all. Direct conflict in games is one of the things I really do not enjoy. but. Like in Blood Rage, like in some few other games as well, this is the whole game. That's everything you do in this game. And with games like that, I usually don't mind that much. I would rather play this than play a really good Euro game which has take that element. Like I can sit in my corner and build a city and then somebody can play a card and burn down my city. I can't do anything about it. That's two hours of my life I'm never going to get back. I don't enjoy that. I enjoy puzzle things, but I also enjoy this. And I've been thinking quite a bit actually about why I like this game and why I like games like Eclipse and games that actually had combat in them. I, and I've come to the conclusion that especially in games like this and in Blood Rage, I enjoy them so much because there's basically no luck in the game. I am not a fan, like for example I said Eclipse, there's a lot of dice rolling, but you can mitigate them. Like, of course you can, like, in Risk, you can roll really bad and still lose, but you can mitigate the dice rolls. So I like this even more, because there's basically no luck in the game. Of course, if you take in the social luck, the social aspect of luck, that, who I'm happy he didn't do what I want to do, or, yeah, I didn't walk into that, then of course there's luck, then there's luck in every single game in the universe. But in this game, basically there's only two aspects of luck, and that is which way these are getting shuffled, so I can actually, if I really need a harvest, I can pick that as the fourth one. They knew there wasn't any harvest, the last player. I pick up the four tiles and there's a harvest in there and that will be really, really beneficial for me. I, that is basically the only way of, 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 of randomness that I can't have any control of, I can't see in the, in before it happens. The only other thing that's actually any randomness in the game is where the combat, the war tokens, where there's going to be war, which uh, continents are going to be regions, there's going to be war in every round. That's basically it, and that is open information before the round, uh, round starts. So everybody can see that and you can plan around that. That is the kind of randomness I do enjoy. So there's really not much random stuff happening in this game. There's no dice rolling, there's no stuff like... Oh, I'm gonna try go in here with this massive army and win. Oh, I couldn't win because you rolled a six. It's not like that. It's more like with the blind bidding in the combat. I love that. Cry Havoc was a game I didn't really like so much, but the one thing I really enjoyed about Cry Havoc was the combat system. This is kind of like that, but I do enjoy this more. This is a blind bidding. It's like a psychological game. I know you really want to do Ronin in your fight, but how much do I want to do Ronin? How much do I want to stop you from getting Ronin? If you are one of the clans that can use money as Ronin, I really have to stack up on that if I really want to have any chance of winning that war 
at all. So I really like the combat system of this game. That's coming from somebody who doesn't like combat in games at all. So I, I, I think this is a game that is really good in that regard. I am having really fun playing these psychological games and trying to think like, oh, if he wants to do that, I want to do that, I'm going to try. That is more important for me, but I don't really care about winning this fight. I just want to get some points out of it. So there's so much stuff going on that you have to think about, which I really, really enjoy. So, as we have been talking about a little bit now, it's a psychological thing. There's also a lot of negotiation going on in this game. Another thing my group isn't really big on is negotiation, because we we like to be in our own corners and do what we do best, puzzling and trying to optimize our scores. We are not really good at this uh, hassling and, and stuff like that. I am maybe the best at it in the group. I, I am good at making people do what I want to do in games. It's, uh, it's, it's good until the time that everybody understands that's what I'm doing and nobody wants to help me at all. But in this game, which I really want to stress, you don't have to do a lot of negotiation to actually enjoy this game. You can, for example, go and watch the Heavy Cardboard uh, video, Heavy Cardboard playthrough to see that you don't need that. You can actually just play the game with just... I think there was just a couple of times where Edward wanted to say, hey, you get two coins for me to do that. But other than that, they didn't really do anything and really made me happy to see that the game could play so well without that layer of gameplay. And I have heard that when you play the game a lot of times those things are coming more into play because you know more what you need, you know more what you really want, what you desire is points of course, but how you want to get those points. So I think that this game is, is really good in that way, that there is that negotiation that you can have, you can uh, do the wheeling and dealing and, and, and trying to bribe people into doing what you want or bribe people into doing stuff and not doing stuff that they will harm you and, and things like that. And I think that is really, really helpful and I think it is, I think that's a really, really nice thing in this game that there's two layers of, of this thing and really they work well. We have in the last game we did, we actually had some more of it and everything works. Of course, if you do a lot of that, then you, the game is going to last really, really long. But I really enjoy those two aspects of the game. Put together, they work really, really well. Another thing I really like is the season cards. Uh, the way you, the way you uh, make your strategy, you can buy monsters. This is kind of the feeling of the drafting in Blood Rage. But it's less random because there's not a draft, so you can't be really happy to... Pick the card you really want in the beginning or draw the cards and I can draw seven cards I don't really need. And when the other packs comes to me, there's no more cards for me. Here, everything is available. So turn order is, of course, really important. But there's so many things to do. There's the monsters that help you in combat or help you in other ways. There's all these different kind of things. And also with the replay value of this is that there are different sets of cards that you can use that will be different each time. So there's a base set that's always going to be in there and there's a set of five cards in each season that will be different uh, when you play with the different sets of cards, which really makes the game have even more replay value. So, uh, yeah, one thing I wanted to talk about is a thing I had heard. I Like, it's really, really hard. You can't really go on to see. I've played the game like five times. You can't go on to see like, oh, this is overpowered or this is too good. You can't do that because the people have played this and this. I... I think they have played it this good enough. Um, I know they when they when they have these stretch goals on Simon campaigns, everything is of course planned from before. They wanted to have eight clans in the game with all the expansions and everything. They wanted to have six players because that's what there's room for on the board. So are they really stretch goals? We're not gonna go into that <laughs> that um discussion right now because that's not what it's all about. Kickstarter, stretch goals is another video altogether. But uh, one thing I have heard a little bit about is that all different clans have their specialty and they really have to play on that specialty to win. So maybe when you play, uh, play the same guy, like same clan, like maybe three, four times, you maybe you're going to end up playing practically the same way every time, even though that's nearly not impossible because there's all this negotiation. You can um, ally up with other players. You can get other season cards. People will start to take the season cards you really need for your strategy. But I think for most players who are going to play this game like 5, 10, 15 times, I don't think that's going to be a problem at all because there are in the base game 5 different clans. So if you're going to play this game like 15 times, then you will play each clan about 3 times. And 
Of course, you're gonna get better at the game and see what you want to do, but I don't think it's gonna be come to that part that you will get bored because you, you're just doing the same thing to get the points that is most beneficial for your clan. So I don't think actually that is any problems at all. So overall, I love the gameplay of this game. Everything is fun. I'm really when I, I want to make a review, I want to see like, okay, what can I say negative about this game? For me, so far, I'm having a problem to see anything negative about the gameplay of this game. I, I'm i having fun from the start to the end. I love the, the, to go into allies. I love to be alone so I can just focus on the things that will give me points without giving benefits to another people's. And I just, I'm just having fun. And you know, if you see my videos, I like fun. I like fun, 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 fun in my videos. I, in my videos, I like fun everywhere. I like fun in my games because that's what I play games. I play games to think, to analyze, to, 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 to strategize and to have a lot of fun. And these games really give me this. I, I want to play this game like every day. This is one of the games I really just have fallen in love with and want to play every single day. And and for me, that says a lot about this game because it's so different from the games I usually enjoy. Uh, but this game just makes my brain work. I love that it, is, it isn't really a heavy game, it's a light, medium game. But I love that there's so many nuances. There's a lot of different ways to go ahead to get the points to, to win the game. I really love that. I... I love all types of games, as you know, I love really light games, I really like really heavy games, but this is like a perfect game for me because you can play it, we play it twice in a row one day and you don't really melt your brain from it, you can play it a couple of times and just have a lot of fun, uh, a lot of thinking of course, but not like a Vitala sort of game or like a heavier kind of game, but still it gives a lot of different meaningful decisions and you're just having fun all the time. A couple of notes before we end off, one thing that you guys have been asking me to do and I'm trying to remember it is to do the player count. For me, I have played a game with three and four players. With the expansion or the Kickstarter exclusive, you can play up to six players. I don't think I would ever play this game with six players. I think I might play it with five, but for me, I think three and four players are the best. Um, Basically because time. I think that a five, a fifth and sixth player would just add more time. I know a lot of people have been playing with with five, but also a lot of players are playing this game really quick. I don't understand how they're doing that because we are not playing really slow, but we're using like, um, for three, three players we're using uh, two hours and for four players we have been using three hours. And I think that's pretty decent for this game. I heard people use like two and a half hours with five players, including rules. I have no idea how you would do that because I can't see a way to do that without always knowing exactly what you want to do without thinking anything, without reacting to what other players are doing. Because it's a game, you, it, it, you can have a strategy, but it's a tactical game because with, if you're recruiting and I see what you are doing, I have to think about what, are my prior, what, what do I have to prioritize, where do I want to recruit. You can't know that from beforehand, so I have no idea how people are playing this like in two hours with five players. No way. Like I, I, I can't see it going down to like one and a half hours with, with three. But that would be a stretch for, for our group at least because we we enjoy, we don't take our time. Like we don't sit there. A couple of times people get AP and have to think a little bit about what they're going to do. But besides that, they really I, I really don't see that this is a game you can actually get through the motion faster. I understand it with a game where people are taking 5-10 minutes during their turns. But this is actually a lot of stuff going on, especially in the war phase. You have to go through like five war phases with three players so when you're playing with five you're gonna go through seven wars in three times at 21 wars with blind bidding with thinking with trying to outbid each other and trying to outthink your opponent i have no idea how to do that in two hours but that's just our group but so you know how long time we used to play it if you think you're super fast you can probably play it faster but for us we have no chance to play this i think faster than like one and a half two and a half hours with three and four players but both of those are really, really great. I want to talk a little bit about odd versus even because a lot of people, like one of my friends who played it, he said he liked it more with the, with the, the, the even and the number of players because then usually, especially in our earlier games, that everybody is in an alliance all the time. But I think, and I've heard on the internet, that the more you play the game, the less uh, likely it will be that everybody's going to be in an alliance, uh, the, no matter how many players you are. Because sometimes it's going to end up not being beneficial for me because I let's see say two people that are uh, lost are uh, gonna go in an alliance then it's two people who are maybe trying to to get the most points to try and do our 
in the lead trying to win, that it wouldn't be beneficial for me to ally with him to help him win. It would be more beneficial to me to try to get the points I can by myself. And I think that's going to be more apparent the more you play the game uh, with the same people who gets into it and gets into the psychological part of the game as well. So for me, I like the game odd and even exactly the same. They're kind of different, but I enjoy them immensely, both of them. The last thing I want to talk about before we wrap up this interview, no, this is not an interview, it's a review, interview, review, two different things. Before we wrap up this uh, review, I want to talk about the Kickstarter versus the Retail Edition. So, a lot of people like with Blood Rage, there was a lot of people like, oh, I don't feel I get a whole full game when I get the Retail version. Uh, when I got Rising Sun, I got five boxes uh, with it. I got the Rising Sun box, I got the expansion, which I paid more for. That's why I got the expansion that's going to be in store. I got a monster pack. From what I understand, that's also going to be in stores. And I also got the uh, Kami Unbound, which add these uh, gods uh, to the game. Not only up here in the shrines, but also adds them as figures that will have special abilities for the people uh, who are in the region they are in. And the last thing was the Dymo box, which hold everything that is a Kickstarter exclusive. And most of the stuff that are Kickstarter exclusives are these plastic upgrade components. So you get these plastic mandates instead of the token ones. You get these plastic flags instead of the tokens. You get the plastic Ronin tokens instead of the token ones. Um, so there's basically kind of token or a component upgrades. I think the components in the retail game is great. I don't I like for me I would never play with it of course when I have these plastic stuff because they look a lot better. But gameplay is the same with those with those things. And the other things that are in the, the um uh, a Kickstarter exclusive box are some monsters. There I don't remember how many there are but it's like 10 monsters I think something like that. Don't shoot me if I'm wrong, there's something like that. And also one exclusive clan, the Fox Clan. So there's five five clans in the game. The Dynasty Innovation, which will be available, have two more clans, that's seven. That's all you need. You don't really need the last clan. So I will say if you really like this game when you buy it retail, I think you should pick up the Kami Unbound add-on expansion. I think that's the most important one for me, which add the the commies to add on the board, they add a subtle change in the game in just a small box. I don't know what the price will be, but I, I really recommend that. And if you really love the game, you can get the, the Dynasty uh, the Dynasty Innovation um, expansion box as well with two more clans and some lucky gods for them to use. There's, and a season set card that may be the thing that I like the most. Uh, I think there was a season set card also in the Kickstarter exclusive that adds a little bit more replay value. But I think if you buy this retail, you're going to have a lot of fun. You're going to enjoy it immensely. If you really like it, you can get the Kami Unbound, which I really recommend. And also if you really, really like it, you're going to play it like 15, 20 times. You can get the Dynasty Innovation expansion box as well. But other than that, I think you're going to have enough content in the retail box. You can play with five players, which I would never play with more than that anyways. I think you will have a lot of fun with this game. This is a game I really like. For me now, it's really early in the year, but I, I think this might be a high contester for a top 10 game of 2018. I kind of hope there are going to be like 10 games going to be better than this, so that will be really, really good year. But I think this is a game that I will enjoy for a long time. I hope to get it played more during the year. That is everything this is going to be. This is a long review. I hope you have been enjoying it. These are my thoughts on Rising Sun. Thank you so much for watching my videos. Thank you so much for supporting the channel. Please like the video. Please comment on the video. Please subscribe to my channel if you haven't already. That really means a lot to me. And that is everything for this time. I am Johannes and you have been watching Board Gaming Ramblings.